Well, that was one of the most iconic football games you will ever see. Oh, by the way, UCF beat Houston 27-13. I'm Eric Lopez. This is Night Shift Post Game alongside Bryson Turner. The game I was alluding to was obviously not the UCF game. It was Ohio State-Michigan, which was incredible. Which is why we start. I, I'll be honest. I'll take the, the the I'll take the heat. I started the show later on purpose because I wanted to watch Michigan Ohio State, which was unbelievable theater. Something that UCF Houston was not, but we'll discuss that. Bryson Turner with me, Kyle Nash, and I believe Nick Purcelli are at the stadium. We'll hope to get them here shortly. But the Knights do go are eligible to go bowling. They beat Houston twenty seven to thirteen. Knights got off to a rough start in the first quarter, a little flat. But turn really dominated the game, in my opinion, from the second quarter on. And uh, big win for UCF, 6-6. Six and six. We'll see where they go bowling. Bryson, you and I were kind of doing the same thing. We both watched the UCF Houston on one eye, and then we had Michigan, Ohio State on the other eye. Uh, we're in the minority because, folks, when the TV numbers come out, <laughs> Michigan, Ohio State is uh, – let's just say they're going to have a wide margin uh, over that. That might be the most watched college football game of the year. But uh, UCF got the job done. Wasn't pretty. There's some issues we'll get into, but they get the job done. And on a way, they pretty much describe the season, some highs, some lows, but they get the win and they're going to play an extra game. Agreed. And this is what we expected for the for, for the season. I, th- I think that getting there was certainly a very rough. I mean, losing five in a row is not never good for anybody in any circumstances. I don't care what you finish your record as, but... The fact that we that you got you've achieved bowl eligibility, which is something that quite possibly none of the other newcomers, unless BYU wins, UCF UCF will be the only Big Twelve newcomer to be still be bowl eligible in the conference and keep that bowl streak now eight years alive, which is de- which is definitely something that I imagine that you know some UCF fan that keeping that going is obviously something paramount that UCF would really would like to keep going, especially when, you know, winning and competing for a conference title is going to be something that's going to be a little more plausible as the, as the years go on and, and the big 12 recruiting cycles start to become more common. UCF improves to six and six Houston. I mean, my goodness. Woo! They uh, jo- uh, Joseph Duarte, the Houston beat writer, already talking about Houston. We'll discuss Dana Hogerson's future. We'll see what happens there. That team looked like a team that was not inspired, especially some of the play calling was bizarre. But nonetheless, uh, we'll see how this goes. We encourage you to bring out your comments and questions on our chat room as well as on social media. Of course, make sure you give us a thumbs up and like us here on the on our YouTube channel. Give us a subscription to the Black and Gold Banner. We'll have a lot of post-game coverage on all UCF athletics right here on Black and Gold Banner. We're the only ones that carry every sports post-game. And uh, we'll also obviously have the website, blackandgoldbanner.com. Kyle Nash will have a recap of this game and much more. You look at the stats, if those are watching. Uh, UCF kind of controlled the game, like I said. Second half, I think Brian W. Peterson, shout out to him, uh, who said it best. Game felt like a tale of two halves. First half was equal painful. Second half, much better. I kind of agree with that. You can make the argument. That's been the story of the UCF season. First half was very painful. Second half of the year, a lot better, much better. Uh, Some room for improvement. But John Rice Plumley in what turns out will be his last game uh, as at home. anyway. Well, it could be at home. We'll see. We'll get to that. Maybe it's not their last home game. Uh, Played magnificent. The big story is the Fox Sports 1 crew, Eric Collins and Devin Gardner, the unofficial UCF broadcast crew of FS1, saying that he is not he's retiring from baseball, Bryson, and he's going to focus on the NFL draft. Your reaction to that, Bryson, is somebody that covered John Rice Plumley in both sports. He's going to focus on football. He'll have at least one more game uh, in his UCF career which will be in the bowl game, but his baseball career is apparently done, according to FS1. Trace Trelko, our good friend uh, uh, from Sons of UCF Live, reached out to UCF Media Relations for a a comment on them. They said that John Bryce Plumley stands by the comments he said on Monday, which he didn't. He kind of dodged the question when he was asked about playing baseball on Monday. Your reaction to all this, Bryce? Well, uh, well, I will say I will. I do want to want to thank you for the little bit of uh, lead time before we went live today because it actually allowed me to listen to the post game uh, live stream on ESPN Plus. 
And listening to John Rice Plumley before we had to come on, I was able to listen to a little bit of what John Rice Plumley had to say. And he himself is saying that he is actually standing by his words that he made that is standing by words. He said that nothing has changed from what he said on Monday. So it's I think on I think what and he said he doesn't know where the FS1 crew got that from. So <laughs> I, so I I think that it's probably going to this is probably I don't know for sure yet. It's either going it's either one he doesn't want to say anything about leaving baseball just yet or he truly does not know yet. And he just wants to pl- play this one game before he makes that decision. Just like how when people want have the extra covid year option to choose from, they take some time sometimes to choose if they would rather take that or or take that or move on. So I honestly, to me, I would, I would treat this as how I would treat that, where we don't, where unless he says he's not, then uh, just assume that, then just assume that he is. And I think that's the kind of the words that he's been going at, like going at, because so I'm not focused on that right now, but so far nothing has changed. He's start, or he just wants to keep where his feet are right now. Well, and he didn't, de- he didn't, right now. But he didn't deny the story either. He didn't deny the fact that he's he's not going to bail on baseball. Look, I, I I know we've got a lot of scrutiny over the FS1 crew not being there on site. I don't know if they were there. Were they? I don't even know if they were there or not uh, in person. We'll ask uh, the folks around. I don't think they just made that up. Somebody told those guys that he wasn't playing baseball. Maybe it wasn't John Rice. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was something that was meant to be off the record. I don't know. I don't think they just made that up. I could be wrong. I, I that's a very well, big you think I, I just do, don't do you think they're just taking his Monday comments out of context or do you think that they're no that's a fair that? point no that's a that's a fair point it could be that it could be that we'll see I don't know that the way they made it sound like though they it fe- made it sound like they pretty much got it on concrete from somebody but I don't know I, I that was very bizarre when that popped up I'm not saying that in, I mean who knows he might decide to wait till after the bowl game to decide to uh, make that decision who knows Exactly just like uh, with just like with you just like with using an extra covid year you know I mean I really I truly think that that's what the way that we should really treat this decision and by the way um to kind of look at that because uh, it, because funny story um John Rice Plum uh, the John Rice Plumley isn't the only player that has been talked about that UCF outfielder Brady Shannon there was a tweet that I saw recently where it was said he's transferring he to play football. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he was a dual sport player just like Plumley was, but he chose to play baseball at UCF. But unlike Plumley, he wasn't playing dual sports. And now this and now it, it seems like he's going to be entering the transfer portal to play football somewhere else. And given how crowded the UCF outfield was in fall ball, I can easily see why he would make that decision. And perhaps the John Rice Plumley sees the same thing. It is a crowded outfield. On the, at the UCF baseball program right now. So if he were to forego his last baseball season, just prepare for the NFL draft, I think that could be a little bit of evidence that he is making that decision. But um, but obviously, you know, you know what they say about assumptions. So um, I would say that you just we, we just wait until he says something and just keep caution about it just don't take it uh, you just let monday well, we'll see what happens we'll see what happens uh we know this he's gonna play at least another game yes. uh, at quarterback and he has to uh, give them going 23 for 20, 23 for 27 on the day 253 passing yards and uh 58 rushing yards and a, t- and a rushing tv overall i mean overall a pretty solid game out of plumley what else stood out to you? Like you look at the box score there in the stats. What else jumps out to you, Bryce? And obviously RJ Harvey, big touchdown there early in the third quarter that gave UCF a lead they would never relinquish. Uh, he's had a great season. But what else stood out to you? Well, I think one thing that really stood out to me was actually that last drive. I want to bring up the drive chart for you all and look at this absolute and look at this absolute beauty uh, in the in the beauty of t- of drive times over these the first the first few dri- these first three drives and these last few drives what we have been saying throughout this i've been saying throughout this whole season that UCF needs to be able to like ha- to have long sustained drives and they and they did that when they needed it like when i saw in the fourth quarter i actually would argue that the fourth quarter is all, is all, is a really cool culmination in the growth of this offense because when they had a drive that was going over seven minutes and just ticking down that clock and not letting Houston get back in the game, I'm like, this is what we've been asking for for the entire season. 
So absolutely well done as far as a play calling perspective from Darren Hinshaw, because look at that. They were actually running the ball and they ran the ball for ran the ball 43 times compared to the 27 throws from John Rice Plumley and RJ Harvey. You know, what's something I actually took a look at the record book. We know from uh, th- and thanks to uh, Nick Porcelli and Kyle Nash, who, who, who one of them tweeted this from the game. RJ Harvey, RJ Harvey is now tied with Isaiah Bowser with the 14 rushing touchdowns in a season that that's the second for you in UCF history right there. But when you look at his yardage or look, no, his carries, he has 190 carries. Now this season overall, you look the 10th most rushing, rushing carries in a single season in program history. The 10th most was 198 from Latavius Murray in 2012. So given that we have another ball game to play, I think yeah, Ar- Ar- plays in that. it looks like RJ Harvey is going to be going to enter the top 10 single season rushing carries in program history. Something that we have not seen since storm Johnson in 2013. 2013. Yep. So yep. I think, so I think that what's really interesting now is we have been seeing RJ Harvey. I would argue that RJ Harvey is the first truly workhorse back like that UCF has seen in a decade because in the decades since UCF has been much more of a running back by committee approach. Sure, but, this, yeah. but I think this is the first time since Storm Johnson that we've really seen a workhorse running back like RJ, and he's been and he's managed to really take advantage of that. His 1,160 rushing yards so far this season actually is ranked number is now the sixth most single season rushing yards in program history. He passed Gerard Davis. And by the way, he's not too far off from, from, from Kevin Smith from what was it? 2005, 2005, Kevin Smith. He's just behind him. He could pass him in the ball in the, well, in he the won't ball. pass Kevin Smith, 2007, which oh, is still the greatest. Uh, that's uh, the oh, greatest season ever. Pro- the ceiling that I could see him getting is he could potentially pass Greg McRae 2018, who is a 1,182 rushing yards. So I think with a good with a good bowl game, assuming I could, he plays the bowl game, we're assuming right, he's going to play. We'll see. Well, um, he's, he's not a senior. He's not like he he hasn't used he up all of his eligibility. He hasn't yeah. used that use it up. Uh, doesn't Michelle, mean he, doesn't mean doesn't mean he has to use it at the bowl game. I mean, uh, I mean I perhaps think not. But if he does play and he does do well, then we could easily that we could see him have the fourth best single Maybe. season rushing yards in we'll program see. history. And so I think that we the fact that they have really leaned into that this game is uh, I think a very I what's the question? I guess maturing from a play calling perspective, they know what they they know what they have and rj i would actually argue last year was the year of john rice Plumley. i feel like this year is the year of rj harvey i don't know about and like they're almost like a 1a and a 1b maybe last year john- no, rj would probably get the team mvp right now absolutely uh we'll see but we'll see there's a lot of questions i have about the bowl game coming up which we'll address and one of them being what brian is bringing up here Elo, any insight on which bowl opponents we may see as Gasparilla and USF a done deal if they win their game this evening? I don't think – I mean, who knows if there's anything done deal or not. I think there's always maneuvering between behind the scenes. I can tell you this, unequivocally, the Cure Bowl wants UCF. The bowl game will be at UCF. Alan Gooch runs that bowl game. They want UCF. Will they get them? We'll see. I would be surprised. If UCF is playing in a bowl game outside the state of Florida, I, I would be surprised if it's not either the Cure Bowl or Gasparilla. Now, obviously, there's been whispers about a potential UCF South Florida game. South Florida has to win their game tonight against Charlotte to be bowl eligible. So until that happens, the other thing we don't know, keep in mind about the American is they have the American Conference Championship game next Saturday. Tulane is hosting either SMU or USTA, depending on what happens today. SMU's playing Navy. If SMU wins, they lock up the spot. I don't know if you have a score on that, Bryson. But the reason why that's important is Tulane right now is in the driver's seat for the New Year's Six Bowl game. But if they lose, let's say, to SMU or USTA in the championship game, that's wide open. Who won? You said USTA, but it's UTSA. I know. I always confuse it with the, 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 the tennis courts. Because it, no it is a similar acronym. I will get I, it is I always do. Acronym. I always mess that up with the tennis courts and the U.S. Uh, deal. But the reason I bring that up is if Tulane loses, then a team like Liberty might sneak in there as a New Year's 16. So that drops the American an extra bowl slot. So okay. 
we so don't know night, what's going to happen from that standpoint. Go. Last night, so last night, it was last night on Black Friday, Tulane beat UTSA 29 to 16. SMU beat Navy 59 14. All right, so it'll be SMU and Tulane, which I think are the two best teams in the Americas. So that works out. We'll see. I'm curious to see if SMU cracks the top 25 in the uh, playoff poll on Tuesday. Otherwise, like I said, they may, if you're Mike Oresco, you might root for Tulane to win just to secure that New Year's six slot. So uh, the reason I bring all that up is that could all impact what UCF's opponent is. I'll say this. I am confident that UCF will not play a power five score. I know PZ Aviation is asking, would any chance we play Miami in a bowl game? I can never say never because you never know. Bowl games can be matched up a certain way. I just have a feeling that UCF's going to get paired up with a G5. And it's probably going to be either a USF or somebody in the American or somebody in the Sun Belt. Could that, you know, we'll see. Obviously, if you're going to play a team like Miami, it would have to be probably, I don't know, can you pull it off in Gasparilla? Would it have to be out of state? I don't know. Uh, but I would, I would, I haven't heard that. I have not heard that. I think UCF will play either in Gasparilla or Cure Bowl, but we'll see. There's a week to go before all the maneuvering and minutia kind of takes place. Do you have a preference, Bryce, or where you want UCF to play their bowl game? Cure Bowl would be – Cure Bowl certainly would be nice. It'd be nice to – you know, it's not every day that you go to – that you're able to go to attend a college ball game in person or cover one because – Obviously, with the travel that we're, travel that requires, we can't do that all the time. So, Cure Bowl would certainly be a certainly be nice opportunity to actually go and see UCF play in the bounce house one more time. So that way, you could have UCF can can have kind of one last bounce and, and not have certain players have one last bounce in the Hula Bowl. So that would certainly be uh, n n nice. But hey, if USF does be does end up being bowl a uh, bowl eligible, then I'd certainly take a Gasparilla Bowl with the war on I four. I think I think if the the Gasparilla Bowl of Florida and UCF proved anything, it's that an in state rival is that a is that if you if a bowl game is able to pull two in state schools to their stadium, and Florida is a, a, a state that has the luxury of doing that, by the way, because with so many college football teams in the state that are able to become bowl eligible in a single season. Florida is one of those one of those states that is has the luxury of doing that. If you're able to do it and it worked out the way that it did with Florida and UCF, then I could easily see a UCF USF Gasparilla Bowl being a very uh shrewd decision from a financial standpoint for for the runners of that ball of that ball game. So, I honestly would take either one you, either one if you see if you see have had to go out of state it'd be nice but it, it'd have to be for a ball well, a ball game a ball game that i would argue is a, a of a higher prestige than either playing at home or playing usf like, i don't think we're gonna get, call it a not sure. yeah that. i don't think we're gonna get that in fact i got a text from somebody that's watching the show that would that knows some things dallas they're hearing first responders bowl is also in the mix do not dismiss the, somebody's disagree mm -hmm. with me i'm saying it can't be which i just don't i don't understand that why aren't you playing in the state of Florida? But it, to me, that's where I, I, if I'm UCF, I'm fighting for a Florida bowl game. I mean, nobody's going to go to Dallas. I mean, it's a beautiful city. Like, don't get me wrong, but who the hell cares about it? And if it is the first responders bowl, that would be against an American team. And it won't be USF, although it'd be hilarious if they put two Florida teams in Arlington. All right. We'll get back to bowl talk to maybe at the end of here. But we got, I feel like we have a couple of guys. Well, no, he's, he's worried. Kyle's working on the uh, microphones here, I think. So we're going to have him on in a moment. He'll give us a thumbs up and he's ready to go. And uh, him and Nick are at the stadium. By the way, I love the jerseys for UCF. I thought it was a good look. I love the helmet. This was their best look of the year. Yeah, I agree. This was a, I agree. It was a very, it was a very well done uniform this time around. I, black and gold is just a great, just a great color. Look, I love Canaveral blue for the one time. With the space game, all everyone's got to have a good alternate uniform, but black and gold is just a tried and true, a tried and true color tr color choice, and and it look it look really good tonight in, in the new in the new uh, in the new light. All right, Kyle, uh, we're gonna try to bring Kyle in right here momentarily. Let's see if he's ready to go. And uh, boom, let's pop him in right here. Oops, still and not ready. Lost him. And we just lost him. Oh, uh, so uh, th th one thing I do want to actually ask you, uh, ask you now, Eric, 
because I don't think we actually gotten a chance to bring this up yet. But what did you think about the UCF defenses performing? Uh, de defenses performing. Yeah, I mean, they. I, I thought this was a good matchup for them. Houston's not a good running team. Dana Hoderson's never been patient with the running game. I thought they matched up well. I know they got off to a rough start in that first quarter, but after that, I thought the defense played well. Uh, but I think the matchups really benefited them. I don't. I'm not. You know. But you know, I thought they played okay against Texas Tech. Played well against Oklahoma State. I think Addison Williams found some things, and some of the young guys stepped up here at the end of the season defensively. So I thought that was very encouraging to see that from this group. So we'll see. Um, that was my thoughts. I thought they I, – I was not surprised. I didn't think Houston was a one-dimensional offense. I know they got off to a good start, but I thought defensively it was a good matchup. They didn't have to worry about the, stopping the run. And I think UCF has shown they are more than capable of slowing down passing games. Agreed. I agree. I think honestly, this uh, I am very optimistic. I would say on the on the future on the future of this defense. I mean, you look at the at the people who are leaving. You are going to you are going to lose Jason Johnson, Walter w Walter Yates, but you but you are going to still have people like you know Lee uh, Tremont. You're going to lose Tremont Morris, Brash, too, but you have Lee Hunter and Nakai Martinez. I think Lee Hunter and Nakai Martinez are going to end up stepping up to kind of become. The leaders of the, the the leaders of this defense going going forward with and given the the performances we've seen out of them the type of player the, the play defensive players they are they're going to be very good role models for each of their respective units going forward. Also, um, can we also great good job on the replay booth for that targeting call on uh, that they put on John Walker there. Um, great good job making sure that wasn't targeting so that way so that way he could play. Walker also is I think has had a very good a very solid season for a true for a true freshman as far as that is concerned. I, it's it's been really interesting to see this UCF defense evolve over the course of this uh, over the course of this season. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, by the way, RJ Harvey still weighing his options between heading to the NFL and returning for another year with UC the program. Mm. Honestly, I wouldn't blame him. He is if he if he's going to get NFL attention, then obviously after a season like this, I would well, not yeah. blame him at all. That's why. That's why I'm not like I, uh, I'm not sure. jumping to con that that he's oh. going to play in the bowl game because uh, again, when you're a running back, your stock is high. You bail. You you mean there's only so much shelf life in that body when you're a running back. And you saw what happened to Bowser when he came back the extra year. I think it hurt him. Uh, so yeah, but I, he I, got I, yes, but he got hurt that first year though. Exactly, that's but, but that's the right, right. But that's my point. Like, if you come back, you run the risk of getting hurt and your stock going down. Like I said, I, maybe I'll be wrong. I think R, I would be surprised if RJ Harvey plays. But uh, well, you know, not, I mean, let's not forget that RJ Harvey already had an injury that he was coming back from, and this this season is like his truly first workhorse season because last year it was much more of a, you know, a committee approach with Isaiah Bowser and Johnny Richardson, but he really set himself apart this year. And I feel like that, that maybe one thing that NFL people might argue is, can you sustain that for, an, for multiple, for multiple years? And so I would argue that coming back is a solid decision, at least a solid decision, because perhaps NFL scouts could say, can you be able to do this consistently? So that could easily that could, I could I'll easily. Curious, I'll be up. curious what Kyle thinks. He obviously covers the NFL. He covers the the, the draft. So uh, he's setting up right now. So we hope to have him again momentarily. He's moved from the stadium location, which is unfortunate because I love that stadium location. We did that? Or cell reception goes to dad, my friend. Fair. All right. I think he's ready now. We're gonna bring him in. There he is. Kyle, do you hear us? Yeah. No, we got you, gentlemen. I'd stop using the he and drop a we. I got Nick Porcelli here. Helping me handle business today, guys. Well, let me ask you, uh, we'll get to the game in a moment, but we just had a lengthy conversation about R.J. Harvey's future. He Obviously, he said, according to what we're seeing, that he's weighing his options, whether he's going to try to play and go to the NFL or come back, et cetera. What, what do you think, Kyle, uh, on his read? I, I, you know, Bryson's already talking about, hey, he'll play the bowl game. He could come back next year. But I'm not sold that he'll play the bowl game. Because his stock may never be as high as it is right now. Where do you fall on R.J. Harvey right now? Well, I, I listen, while it's nice that UCF is in the Big 12 as a Power 5 team, I still don't think they, that this is the kind of program that brings enough notoriety to have a guy that can just sit 
and, you know, let let it kind of rush into the thing. The fact that he is sitting might even be a bigger story than the game itself, uh, theoretically. I think he's going to do kind of like what Isaiah Bowser did, you know, play, see if his performance in a bowl game can raise his stock and, and you know, turn kind of people his direction. It's the kind of thing that you saw, um, let's just as an exa- another example, for now, an, a new, another newcomer to the Big 12, Zach Wilson, parlayed a big performance at BYU and obviously we saw he's a complete fraud in the NFL but that being said I think this is an opportunity where you can have a solid bowl performance that can get people in and and get you in in a bigger audience than you normally get okay so you think he'll play the bowl game to try to improve his stock and then make the decision maybe a little bit after that we'll see that's interesting that's a good perspective I I'm really interested to see what happens with him uh there uh all right let's get into the game a little bit Nick's there with you as well he uh Give me your thoughts on this game. You slow start for uh, both of you here. I'll give you thoughts. Slow start, first quarter, Houston scored early. But I thought UCF kind of controlled the game. I never felt concerned about Houston throughout, especially in the second half. Well, give me your both your thoughts. Well, I mean, listen, let me open this one because I've been biting at the uh, – chomping at the bit to do it. I mean, no disrespect to any of the friends of the program who tweeted like this, but somebody made an asinine comment that Houston made it look easy in their first drive to score. Sure, they only needed a trick play and a quarterback run, and the guy to make a catch of his life on a fourth down to score a touchdown. But yeah, sure, Houston made it look easy. Listen, actually, the fact that they did what they did to score but needed what they needed to in order to pull that off, I knew still even then that UCF had control of this game, and it's no accident that if you count in the points that uh, Colton Boomer, uh, with all the missed kicks, he would have had 30 points. Nick and I both picked 31 in the round table article, which you'll find on the black and gold banneret.com. So yeah, I, I don't think it was in any other control uh, than UCS throughout the day. I'm completely with you on that Elo. And by the way, congratulations on hitting your over or sorry, your bet rather your cover. The spread, baby, 13 and a half. That, that last drive, this is why gambling, this is why football is one of the reasons why football is always popular. Even when the game is over, it's really not over. I, so. Do you do fantasy football for college yet is what I'm asking. But no, we don't do that. No, I've done that in the past, but no. By the way, uh, hail to your victors, uh, Kyle Nash. Jim Harbaugh will get to still coach as Michigan beat Ohio State because Ohio State chokes like they always do. Anyway, <laughs> I think we need your reaction. Nick, your thoughts on the UCF game? Well, Coach Malzahn mentioned in his post game. Ultimately, not a slow start for UCF, but in my opinion, once they got the lead – they were always one step ahead. There were moments where, like, it looked like, you know, things could, might used to come back. Coach Malzahn even said they looked like they had a little bit of momentum, even though they had the lead going into half with the miss field, with the block field goal and everything. But they came out in the second half. They played a much better game. They were really good with clock management, hit on some big plays, and they just made it to where Houston couldn't come back. So, overall, really good job by UCF football today. Nick, you mentioned something interesting, actually, because we haven't, haven't actually gotten a Colton Boomer just yet. This nope. I've, noticed, I've noticed this season that he seems to have kind of gotten off his game a little bit this season. What Did, what, did Coach Malzahn have anything to say about, Colt, about, about Boomer and going forward and what maybe he needs to work on to kind of get his mojo back? I, I don't think it's so much him being off for the season, Bryson. Let, let's let's pump the brakes on that. He did win the Boise State game. No, yeah, he started the year been, good. I just mean he, as a late. He's been struggling, you know, certainly within a late. And that's what Coach Malzahn said. He did point that out. He did say there was a discussion, you know, about going on. But he's like, ultimately, he won us the Boise State game. And he's done well over all this year. So, yes, he's been a little off. But I think the team still trusts him. Maybe not in this game, but overall, they still trust him. And... I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what happens come the bowl game. To your point, though, Bryce, and somebody uh, did ask about that in post game whether they had considered making a change for who was kicking the ball. Coach Malzahn did say they talked about it, but eventually, eventually, obviously, decided to stick with Boomer, and I think rightly so for him to get his confidence back up. Where I think your concern will come into play is if during the bowl game they're in a close situation and they need a big kick. Can Colton Boomer come out? I think that's the biggest question at this point. Well, and his kicks have not been good. And again, you know, we I argued this with Jeff. And you guys discussed this on the bowl game. Even going back to last week against Texas Tech, I know that the technically that ball was deflected by him, but his kicks are coming in low. Like today, all his kicks are low, Kyle. Uh, I just don't think – I don't know if he has a tired leg or he's lost confidence, maybe a combination of two things, but it's not been pretty. Neither was that last drive again in the first half again. 
What are we doing? Help me. Please, both of you. What are we doing at the end of these halves, Kyle, where don't we don't? It was as bad as last week. They didn't necessarily. Oh, no. no. Right, and that's to Nick's point. They managed the clock properly to where they still, worst case scenario, were thinking to walk away with three. Now, granted, to your point, uh, Boomer, you know, kind of shaking the kick there with all of that, but of the choices that were made, the only criticism I would levy necessarily is maybe if you're deciding to kick, not call the timeout with as many as seven seconds left, but, I mean, that's quite a nitpick at this juncture. But, yeah, compared to last week, they took the shot to Kobe Hudson, it didn't fall right. They certainly learned a lesson from that situation. But I'll put it this way. It's not that I think all of Boomer's kicks are coming in low. I don't think that's the issue. But I think Gus Malzahn, after the game, made the great analogy to it being like a golf swing for you golfers out there. One minute you're booming at 300 yards. The next you're shanking everything all over the place. And I can speak to having to deal with such difficulty personally on the golf course. So I related to it definitely that way. Hey, I was taking golf lessons over this fall, so same, so same here. You gotta wonder if, like this, like having some time off, like they're gonna have a few. Weeks Maybe that's gonna be good for him. You know, he can put those things behind him, and he can just focus on practicing, resting up. You know, one thing that I think that is interesting to me is, he, is Eric. You said his kicks are coming in low. So I'm wondering if maybe what's been going on, and this is just kind of, and this is just something interesting to talk about on my part, is that what if Colton Boomer's just been trying to increase his distance? Because when you kick lower, it kind of helps increase your the distance you're able to kick the ball. So do you think maybe Colton Boomer's just been working on trying to increase his distance, and this has been a little bit of a byproduct of that, maybe? Maybe well, if we if we ever get to talk to him, we'll get to ask him, right? <laughs> right. I think to put a bow on it, too, that's part of the mental aspect, uh, Bryson. I think because he's rattled, he's trying to kick the ball harder, which means if you're trying too hard, you're going to have, you know, potentially sell out on accuracy. I think that's where it all goes to. But I don't want to spend too much time on special teams because it's only a matter of time before Ila's like, why are we still talking about kickers? But I well, well, to be fair, the, the, I would argue that special teams is the is the only unit that I feel like that is kind of on the down on the downturn going in. You, the offense has kind of been up and down, you know, a little bit, but injuries kind of ha, kind of had a, a thing with that. The defense, I would argue, has kind of been steadily going up for the most part. So, but the special teams is the only one where I feel like it's been a little bit of a net negative over the over the course of the season. They get great at the beginning. What I mean is just kind of a kind of a you know a down from there. You know what I mean? Well hey listen if you've been reading night class every week on the black and gold banneret.com I have said similar stuff. Um, not just with the field goal kicking unit or replace kicking or anything like that. I think that's kind of been a general trend with special teams in general, uh, you know, for example, albeit inadvertently, you end up with a uh, kick starting at the six or, or, or fielding a kick rather at the six where the offense then has to go 94 yards to their credit. They pulled it off, which we'll have plenty to say, I'm sure, about R.J. Harvey and John Rice Plumley in this show. But yeah, that's, you know, just overall, they're the trend. They're the group, I feel like, that's been kind of grading out the lowest consistently throughout the week if you've, if you've been reading night clubs. Obviously, a lot made nowadays on Senior Day. Who's walking and who's not walking and all that. Give me your thoughts, Kyle, on the guys that did walk and pretty much are playing their last games. John Rice Plumley being among them. Fox Sports 1 reported that he is done with baseball, that he's going to focus on the NFL draft. I saw on social media he's refuted that in the Correct. post-game press conference, although he didn't deny it. He said he's still thinking about it. Am I correct on that? Yeah, no, that was his response. Well, I think his direct response to him ceasing playing baseball was, and I quote, I don't know where they got that from. Um, with all that being said, though, things are still, nothing's changed yet was where he left it at. Those are his words. Um, but that's not to say he won't be playing anymore. I mean, you, the sultan of, of stickball that you are, Eric Lopez, was the one who told me that a different coaching staff may, may treat his two-sport status different than Greg Lovelady lady did. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's on, That's what I think the biggest hurdle would be um, in my mind. Well, if, he, if, if he wants to play in the NFL, he probably needs to focus on that right at, right now, like after the bowl game. Like, you can't just play baseball. I mean, you got to do combines. and Because I have a lot of questions whether he can make it to that league, whether he can make it as a quarterback. Does he have to change positions? So if he is going to focus on playing in the NFL as his goal, he probably should bail on baseball now. 
Yeah, a- absolutely. Now, now, how realistic his chances are of getting in there, I don't think that's for this episode, but I have my sure. questions too. Yeah. Uh, give me your thoughts on him and R.J. Harvey and their performances and some of the other seniors that walked as well. Uh, R.J. RJ not being a senior, but he obviously was a big factor this year. But give me your thoughts on the guys that walk like John Rice and this offense and uh, getting a bowl game. Nick, I'll let you talk about RJ in a minute here because I know you have a lot of stuff about the the stats that he drew up in the big season that he had. But for me, the number of offensive linemen who walked today throughout the depth of it, I think, is a bit uh, scary for me. You know, uh, anyone from, yeah, exactly, anyone from Ed Collins to to any of the other guys to uh, a lot of the transfers and a lot of the people that came out there, there's going to be an impact there and, and People are going to be relying on Gus Malzahn's uh, recruiting ability to kind of shore that up, I'm sure. What else is new? Um, the, the the number of O-linemen, by the way, I actually have the, li- the list with me r- uh, right here I found on Twitter. Uh, Lokahi Paole, Bula Schmidt. That's a big Jones. loss, by the way. That, let's not, like, sneeze on oh, that. Yeah. He, oh, look, I would look. argue, from a team MVP standpoint, you probably vote for Harvey, but I think number two should be the, that young man right there, what he's done with this offensive line. Oh yeah, Lokai, he absolutely, absolutely well done on his part. Like the elder statesman of that lineman. But Paolo Schmidt, John Harris, Ed Collins, and T- Tylen Grable, and then tight end Alec Holler as well. Let's not forget his contributions to blo- to blocking on the O-line as Excellent well. Protector downfield too, Bryson. Indeed, indeed. So I would de- so yeah, no, I there was a, a, a there was a good portion of these seniors that run, have run out of eligibility that are O linemen but i would counter that argument with john john you know gus malzahn and herb hand have had to really wrote really have a have had a revolving door of offensive linemen even coming in to this season in the first place when transfer portals or whatever so my argument would be coming in the last year this is just the same this is just par for the course yeah but you don't like to necessarily see that right i, I mean if you're trying to build the quarterback is is obviously important, but that's a single guy. I would argue finding a new quarterback is easier than rebuilding an entire unit. And and now they're potentially going to have to do that in two places, both on the offensive line and with the linebackers. So I think there's a lot of challenge there to, to replace both units um, for sure. I agree 100% with that. This is going to be a young roster next year, more than likely. Obviously, they're going to hit the portal for some of this, but they do lose a lot of personnel. You mentioned the offensive line. I think that's valid, Kyle. This was a very good offensive line, maybe the best offensive line they've had in a handful of years. Make sure you keep Herb Hand happy here too, right? <laughs> you got to, I'm telling you, with all these coaching changes going around the, the, this offseason, he's going to get some phone calls. I'm telling you, he's going to get some phone calls. I hear you. It's a concern to have, but the read I kind of make is is when I think of Herb Hand, I think of a guy that's Gus's right hand. I, I don't see them parting ways anytime soon, uh, or at least I'll put it this way. I would wait for uh, Coach Miles Zahn's contract to expire here at UCF before Herb, Herb Hand makes a move. Okay. I could be wrong. That's all speculation. But. We'll see. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of positions and questions. I mean, among guy, and then there's guys that we wonder – you know, even though they're not seniors, do they come back or not? Like, what does R.J. Harvey do for his future? What do some other guys do? So I think this roster is going to be young. The good news is next month, you know, it's signing day. This is supposedly a top 30, top 35 class in the country with a lot of four-star guys. You know, so that it, I think next year is more of a rebuild year than people are going to want to admit. They won't admit it. They won't acknowledge it. But I think it's more of a rebuild next year. I think 2025 is the year to circle. For this team to be maybe, I think, the goal to be a legitimate contender in the Big 12, which is why I don't think this season was a success. But that's a whole other argument for another show. Well, listen, you can whine and and be all negative as you want, even though you hit your cover, Eric Lopez. But there's a source right there that kind of echoes your sentiment a little bit. And his name is Gus Malzahn. He he said himself that we're not, you know, necessarily uh, thrilled about the season, but we are happy that we've got in the eighth bowl game. And I think that's well, right where everybody should be. Well, I think, look, let me say this. I don't think the season's a success. I don't think the season's a failure. It's yeah. kind of in between. Right. I, don't, I agree with nobody, that. Nobody, I, I think that's the way to do it. I, anybody that wants to, like, the, the column, I'm not even going to mention the column that was absurd. 
this week about, oh, the fact they're in the Big 12 this year, is a, that's in itself is a success. Give me a break. <laughs> Are you kidding what? me? Look, you don't believe in the Olympics defense that the honor is in taking part, Eric Lopez? This is we, the, the thing is, is I feel like that it's almost like going into watching the movie. The I felt like it was, I fe- almost felt like with this season, it's like how I felt going in to watch the new Disney movie, Wish. I had no expectations for it whatsoever, and it ended up being okay at the okay at the end. Not great, not great at all. I'll well, give you a, I'll give okay. you a better comparison. This is like my academic career. I pretty <laughs> much co- I, I I pretty much coasted to like getting a seventy and passing. That's how. That's my. That's pretty much this season. I barely passed. I did the bare minimum to, to pass my course. All right. So I can relate. I can relate to this UCF football season because this was pretty much my academic career. So what you guys are basically saying is this year is basically the record, five hundred. Pretty much. I mean, and here's really I'll give you that. this. I give you this other stat. You realize UCF zone has played six teams up until this point. It could change after bowl game. Only six teams with a five a better rec a winning record. They have. Two wins against teams with a winning record. Boise State, who fired their coach and is playing for the Mount West title game, which that's been hilarious. And Oklahoma State, obviously. Those are the two marquee wins. You had two losses against teams with a 500 or worse record. Baylor, which we were all there for that. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, Texas Tech game last week. Now, obviously, Texas Tech, if they were, uh, win their bowl game, they have a winning record, so that could change. Well, that and Texas stat. Tech had the same issue, too, that UCF did, quarterback injury. So I think sure. that was a factor, too, with Baylor. I mean, we keep making, we keep uh, kind of skirting past that. Well, and I think the quarterback will certainly have to be a position of address. That we'll get to more of the offseason and what the roster will look like in a nut down the road on that. Uh, let's talk about the bowl game. What are, you, what are you guys hearing? What's the word, the chatter in the press box? Who was there representing as far as bowl games? Some talk. I mean, I think it should be the Cure Bowl or Gasparilla against the G5. There's somebody texting me during the show that knows a thing or two that, you know, let's just say invest money into the program. Some people are hearing Dallas uh, with the Responders Bowl. What are you guys yeah. hearing uh, from your perspective? Well, I've heard those three bowls. Um, I've heard, and, and I think it's the Independence Bowl that's in Shreveport. Oh, Shreveport, baby. Yeah, um, you know, certainly a vacation destination, 100%. I know you're so, fired up for that one, Kyle. You're fired I, up Listen, I, I'm with you, though. For me, I think the best-case scenario concept for UCF with minimal travel and maximum game is to, gain rather, is to host, let's say, Liberty or somebody like that in the Cure Bowl. Now, granted, if they can get another similar deal to going to the Gasparilla and getting another uh, struggling Power 5 team as they did at the Gus Varilla facing the Gators a couple years back, that would too, that too would be pretty awesome uh, in its own right. But uh, for me, I think, um, much to the chagrin of just Jeff Sharon, I'm sure that UCF hosting the Liberty Flames would be an excellent outcome. By the way, if those watching, I'm, I'm reacting to what Bryson just told me about volleyball. We'll get to that crazy finish. What a way to end their season. Holy crap. Anyway. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, oh, all right. Oh, all right. Boy. Sorry. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, football, gentlemen. Football. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Bryson distracted me with the volleyball. Anyway. I, I, I said that a little bit ago. Um, I was so, just caught up. But, uh, but let, me, here, let me just say this about the bowl game. The only way I could justify playing out of state is if you're playing a fellow Power 5 team. That maybe you don't get to oh, play. Of in the course. So let, let me just say that for the record. That might be the angle. I don't know. TV's going to be involved in this. There's going to be a lot of back channel negotiation stuff that happens. We know this from the Gasparilla Bowl where ESPN kind of made that Florida UCF game happen, even though Florida didn't want it to happen, right? Oh, hey, so, similarly, Florida had to duck UCF for an NY6 Bowl too as well. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. By the way, the, the Independence Bowl this year. The planned matchup, the conference tie-ins for that matchup, Big 12 versus Pac-12. Could we maybe? And that's a power five. I mean, that's your power five where maybe you trade playing in the state, go to a lousy city like Shreveport. Oh, yeah. Maybe get a preview of one of your new Pac-12, uh, Pac-12 schools that are going to be coming over, maybe. Yeah, I would imagine you could potentially see just off the top of my head like in Arizona, for example. Or somebody like uh, whew, that's a, um, a Washington State, even. Yeah. Somebody like that. Colorado? Uh, no, no I, I don't know. Well, and I, I, here's why I disagree on Arizona. I would be surprised. I don't think that you, if you're UCF or the opponent from the Pac-12, that you want to play a team that you're going to play next year on your schedule as a conference game. Usually schools try to request, hey, we're, for example, 
like UCF and Florida will not play this year in a bowl game because they both are going to play next year. So both schools will say, hey, like we're playing them next year. Can we not set this up, please? We rather whatever. So again, this goes back to all the back channels and negotiations that are going on from that standpoint. Um, so I, I think there's a I think it's gonna be and I don't and I mentioned this earlier, Kyle. We may not know if we might know where UCF I think we'll know where UCF will play bowl wise. Early this week, I think we'll hear between your connections, my connections, other friends' connections. Holy, Max, something got shot there. Um, we'll hear whispers of where UCF's playing. We may not know the opponent until next weekend, depending on who the opponent is. Because remember, the American Conference Championships next week, which could impact Correct. the New Year's Six Bowls and all the bowl tie-ins as well. So, what no, is going on, Nick? Good. Nick, what is going? You guys get what's going? They're taking down the stadium. What's going on? Someone is definitely pouring we- ice on the bleachers. I have no <laughs> idea what the hell's going on. He'll okay. be okay. Don't worry. I'll be fine. <laughs> fair. Okay. Uh, fair. All right, so ahead, I'm, I'm just look d- double checking on the first responder bowl to kind of see what kind of op- op- opponent we're looking at there. So Big Twelve ha- had renewed its rotating appearance schedule with the first responder bowl through 2025. Uh, the ACC announced a partial tie-in with the bowl beginning in 2020. That will set the conference will send a team to one of three bowls, which would be first responder Gasparilla or Birmingham. A uh, CUSA has an agreement where it could send one or more team to a pool. Uh, right. There's all these agreements so, that are very they, loosely, very yeah, loosely. Yeah, I, I would argue. I would argue if 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 I would actually argue then if we have to go to an out of state bowl game, I think the Independence Bowl will be the one that I go to because it guarantees a Power Five opponent in yeah, yeah. a Pac-12 team. So um, so I think the three the three I think a one A curable one A one B is curable Gasparilla Bowl if USF. And then you have no, independent, and then independence Hold bowl. On. All right, independence bowl could easily be number two, like cure bowl, independence bowl. I don't, I, I like in state games. What can I say? For, for for nothing else, UCF should not leave their house to go chase down the cows. That's that's not no. I agree that's, with that. That's not I agree. a good. That's not a good deal. There's even better. There's even better teams in the conference for the oh, American. Okay. So you yeah. think that if the Gasparilla Bowl even offers UCF in the first place? That UCF might say no because uh, might say no then. Yeah. Well, what's the game? Who? It, it, this just for another stadium that they can't fill that that won't come and see uh, the cows in the first place. And I know UCF travels well and they have a lot of good numbers in the history of the Gasparilla Bowl. But unless it's another Power of Five, I think that's a losing proposition too. I, I think we've hit on something. If you're UCF, you're chasing down a Power of Five game if you can. And I right. think yeah. it might mean going to Shreveport or Dallas to do that. If they end up in one of those two bowl games outside the state, that's what this is about, right? Yeah. Because I think it's going to be harder to get a Power 5 game in the state, especially the Cure Bowl. There's no chance of that in the Cure Bowl. And I think there are some people – I don't apply to this. There are some people that believe we rather travel to reward the players on the season than playing again at a stadium that you've played all year. No, and I think there's right. definitely some logic to that, 100%. But also, by the same token, the, the merit that the Cure Bowl has, if they can draw Liberty, which I feel like that's a place that they they can pull them in. That's Liberty assuming they're not in the New Year's Six Bowl, which, again, if Tulane loses to SMU next week, Liberty could slide in there if they win Okay, out. and hey, listen, I'll take a Tulane rematch. Any, you know, the chance to play a nationally ranked team is the, is, is the punchline, though. And who knows? Maybe if, sure, sure. They, yeah, if they don't take care of business, a good – how you say co- uh, a uh, consolation prize is playing a nationally ranked team and handling business there for the opportunity too, I should so, say. So then maybe would you you would say maybe an Independence Bowl number one, maybe number two would be a Power Five matchup in the first responder bowl because obviously first responder has CUSA ties. And then number three would be maybe a Cure Bowl against the Power Five team maybe because you would draw in Liberty for that. Or I'm, tell- like that. I, I'm telling you if I'm UCF, it's a Power Five Bowl one. And then two is the Cure Bowl. I'm not wasting my time anywhere else if it's not a Power 5 team, if I can control it. Which, with UCF's history of travel, I think they have a pretty good negotiating spot. Yeah, well, no, and listen, I mean, we've seen – the UCF now is on the other side of this. Right. That Florida was, right? Like, other teams – you have some pull here to some extent of what you want to do than you did when you were in the America, right? Because when you were in the America, you were trying to shoot high – Sometimes you were successful, sometimes, you know, and, and for the most part, they actually give credit to the American. They got to go to the military bowl against Duke, obviously Florida and Gasparilla. Who knows? Maybe he Mike Oresco was actually a good commissioner, Eric Lopez. You think? Might... You think? I mean, 
Um, we'll mm-hmm. see. I'm very and, and, and again, this is UCF's first year in the Big Twelve, so I would think the Big Twelve is going to treat them well in all this. That's the other, you know, that will help them go. Hey, we want to play here against so and so. So it's going to be interesting. It will be interesting. We will have a football game. That we do know of. Let me ask you this, Kyle. How many guys do you think will opt out of this bowl game? Who who do you question? Not uh, I'm not talking about the obvious guys that, hey, we know Plumlee is in his last game. We know the offensive line. Most of those guys are done after the bowl game, assuming they even play in the bowl game. Who are some guys you're curious about to see? Will they play in the bowl game? Do they opt out? Who are some names? I mean, obviously, the head of that list is RJ Harvey. I think that's a big deal. Um, you know, I would also put in both Kobe Hudson and Javon Baker. You know, they're both guys who are, are you know, at the end of their particular tenures, they may they may themselves go pro and, and be opting out. Um, a name I think you may want to watch for in the event that he might be transferring and it might be another trans uh, a transition based on NIO money potential, a la a, a Ryan O'Keefe, might be Xavier Townsend. I'd watch that. I, I don't think it'll happen, but as the guy who would be the heir apparent to be one of the top receivers on the squad – um, that's an incumbent, you have to think somebody's going to give his camp some calls. Um, but beyond that, I, I feel like the offense is mostly pretty safe. Um, well, and, I do have a yeah. question about that. I, I do have a question about that, actually. So looking through the players that walk and then the roster, like who's a senior, redshirt senior, etc., I noticed that Ricky Barber, Johnny Richardson, and Josh Seliscar were not part of that. What are you guys' thoughts as far as whether it's them coming back or maybe it's one of those things? One of those things I think maybe there could be a looking at NFL prospects potentially or transfer. Um, in 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 Josh's case, I think that's that's a thing. Um, in Ricky Barber's case, I think that's a thing. Um, but beyond that, I'm I'm going to reserve comment to see if they actually play in the bowl before I really say anything because they're op- they're opting into playing in the bowl. Uh, really speaks more volume to whether they're going to stay or not. All right, listen, we've been waiting long enough to talk about him. You mentioned already. Let's just talk about him. Our yeah, Nick, you've been chomping at the bit on this, haven't you? Yes. Yes, I have. Yes, we spend entirely too much time talking about kicking, Bryson. Yes, we need to talk about the star <laughs> of the day and probably the star of the season, the MVP, as Eric Lopez said. Today he had 136 yards, two TDs. With those touchdowns, he's now tied for second with Isaiah Bowser for the most rushing touchdowns in UCF history, only behind Kevin Smith. He is also now over 12,000, 12, excuse me, 200 yards. Last person to do that, also Kevin Smith in 2007. That that man's name came up a lot today. Okay. <laughs> um, I've heard this much about Kevin Smith in this decade. That's yeah. true. Nick, so I listen, will. So listen, I got a question for you guys then. Looking at all of it and considering the competition he's played compared to Kevin Smith, where does RJ rank, like this season, where does it rank on the all-time UCF running back list? Where is it? Ooh. Ooh, Definitely not as good as, not, not Kevin Smith. I, I, not okay, Kevin Smith. Okay, let me tell you why you're wrong there, Sultan. Really? He, ne- he never played a Power 5 schedule. And as much as why you, I brought it up. Exactly. And as much as you want to poo-poo on the Power 5 schedule in question, Eric Lopez, it does represent a next-level sort of thing. I think it was Jason but, Johnson who said it. Yeah, but here, here, here's what I'm going to dis- All right, here's what I'm going to disagree. R.J. Harvey has better, way better, better talent. R.J. Harvey has way better talent around him than Kevin Smith did. Kevin Smith did not have John Rice Plumley at quarterback. And my, my good friend Kyle Israel, with all due respect to Kyle Israel, he's a he was a handoff. His best quarterback play was a handoff. His receivers <laughs> are nowhere near as good as this core of receivers. Offensive line, now, let's give credit to the offense, Josh Sitton, who was on that offensive line, maybe the best offensive lineman in UCF football history from a standpoint of pro career. Uh, Excellent you know, player. Is, I think he's entering the Green Bay Packer Hall of Fame this year. Could be a guy that's on the Hall of Fame list, whether he gets in or not, who does. But overall, RJ Harvey has way more talent around him with an, more games, by the way, than Kevin Smith played. Kevin Smith nearly broke Barry Sanders' record. And Kevin Smith got the ball 25, 30 times. He was the football team. He was the offense. He saved George O'Leary's you-know-what because that team was decimated and destroyed by South Florida and looked like a lost season. And Kevin Smith literally grabbed that team on his back and carried him to the first conference championship game. With all due respect to R.J. Harvey, he didn't have to do that this year. Did not. Oh, listen, okay, so I just fair. pulled up. That is, Bryson, I gotta say, listen, that is very fair. Okay, yes, he has had more talent around, around him. 
but let's turn that. Not around. even close. Look, look, no, 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 no. He's no. got a point that's no. going to dunk no. on you. Take your, take that is your very good. That is a very good point. But let's turn that argument around. He's also had a lot more talent coming after him. Okay. No, he's, actually, I disagree with that. Oh, okay, I disagree no. with that. No. I thought you were going a different direction. Here's the reason, though. Even with the talent around him, he, even not being the only guy, he still put up those kind of numbers. Yeah. He's not getting as many carries, and he's still putting yeah, up numbers but it's not that even... look like his again Great. better talent. Great. That's half of yeah, the yardage right. that Kevin Smith got. Like, Kevin Smith was literally the entire offense. Defenses didn't plan to stop R.J. Harvey. They planned to stop UCF's offense because you had to worry about Plumlee's legs. You had to worry about the receivers. You had nothing else at UCF with Kevin Smith. It's not even close. It's This is a ridiculous argument. No, it's R.J. not Harvey, ridiculous argument. R.J. Harvey, Harvey will not even start the entire year, Eric well, Lopez. You can choose to ignore that if you way. like. But in those games, you better bet yeah. they were preparing for R.J. Harvey and to portray yeah. otherwise as incomplete. How did he do? Who had the big fumble in the Baylor game? Gee, look, really? You're going to go by one play? Yeah, yeah, Guys, yeah, yeah. who had 600-yard yeah. games out of the past seven? I can play that game, too, Kevin Eric Smith Lopez. Who had more same. consistency overall? One play, Kevin you do Smith. better. That's you, a crap okay, argument. Okay, you do you better. 2000, look, two, 2007, 2007 UCF football. I just looked up the schedule to see the difference in play. These are some teams that UCF had to play in 2007. Oh, here we go. NC State <laughs> on the road. Number six, Texas. First game in bounce house history, 35-32. There's, the, there's a significant fumble for you, Eric Lopez. That's at, Kyle Israel. That was Kyle, but boy, right? boy. At number five, USF. That was when USF actually had a good football program. Um, <laughs> they, they also – true. Also, no, he's right. I mean, that's fair. He is right. No, that's why it's funny. You also – then, of course, you also have the – then, of course, you also have a Liberty Bowl against against Mississippi State. You had to. You also had a blowout of Marsh, a blowout of Marshall. You had. You hosted Tulsa, Memphis. You beat Memphis fifty six twenty. I would argue that this. This is. I would argue that the the team the 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 teams this year are a little better, but not by much than two thousand seven. Right. I think. I would say that the, that the difference in that 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 Arch, that Kevin Smith's just pure like just. Uh, rushing yard total, like the fact that he got like so much that he almost that he has the FBS R Barry Sanders record is enough to cancel out the fact that this year's quality of opponent for RJ Harvey only slightly over uh out it's the greatest. How many football. nationally ranked teams did he play against? Because I know that UCF had three of them who made who were nationally ranked at some point in the season. Two. Texas and uh, Texas and USF. Yeah. Texas and USF too. Not much. It's a it's look with a year. lesser a lesser team. All right, lesser talent, and I would argue a, a lesser coaching staff. Well, uh, listen. The only thing I take issue with is Eric Lopez calling the argument ridiculous. That's a yeah. big much. Yeah, Let's find out if RJ Harvey even makes all conference. Well, okay, anywhere. okay. So this, I don't think he will. This is well. That's, that's more about the players in I, the other teams. Eric. I don't. I mean, I Tom don't Brooks is like, going to be a problem. Also, I don't want to actually rain on anybody's parade here, but RJ Harvey actually only has 14 rushing touchdowns this year. The two, the extra two, the, well, that's because the, that he, uh, you guys said it was 16 rushing touchdowns. The six, that's true. He's going to get the in the 16 game touchdowns game. total. He has two receiving <laughs> touchdowns. What to, to his next point, record, yeah, that stat is incomplete. His, his actual record is he's tied for the fourth most touchdown score by a single player. In a single season, which from Isaiah Bowser last year, that's the tie. The rushing touchdown total, Isaiah. All of those touchdowns that Isaiah had were rushing, so that were rushing touchdowns. So in that, how many did Kevin Smith had in his year? Oh, he had a lot. Uh, <laughs> a lot. How many rushing touchdowns? Rushing. Here it is. So Isaiah Bowser had 16 rushing touchdowns. R.J. Harvey is actually tied as far as a rushing touchdown standpoint with 1995 Marquette Smith. 2009 Bryn Harvey and 2013 Storm Johnson, which by the way, I do feel like that RJ Harvey is a more of a Storm Johnson, Latavius Murray type and not <laughs> like a Kevin Smith type. Kevin Smith, by the way, 29 rushing touchdowns. Hello, how many again? Hello? How no, many? Eric, do better. Oh, thank because you. you just, your own point defeats it. He's the one that gets the Look, ball all the I, time. Of course, he's going to get all the touchdowns. Okay. People Kevin Smith, by the way. Up. People are coming up to try to stop R.J. Harvey, and that's where the, that's where the receiver. Hey, what, you think they were trying to stop Kevin Smith back in the day? He was a top ten Heisman finalist. Top You're 10. not listening. You're waiting to talk. 
It's the fact that the reason why the receivers can eat is because of R.J. Harvey. R.J. Harvey shared amongst the R.J. Harvey's had the second best season since. Uh, I'll say this: he's had the best season since Kevin Smith. He's the oh, second sure. best season ever. But there's not even close, not even remotely in the same stratosphere. We will never see a season like Kevin Smith ever again, ever. Let's it's unbelievable. Let's, let's not forget, by the way, that. We have not seen a workhorse back like R.J. Harvey in like a decade. Storm Johnson and Latavius Murray are the the first running backs that I can think of in that think of in the past that have that have been like because we've been having this running back by committee approach for a lot, which we have given it's us great happy. running backs like Greg McRae, for instance, but and Adrian Killens. But R.J. Harvey has essentially carried this running back program mostly on his back with Johnny Richardson kind of being more of a change of pay, a change. Of pace. RJ Harvey's been dominating the running back carries is what I'm saying. And we have not seen a UCF running back do that since, uh, since storm Johnson and uh, since storm Johnson and Latavius Murray were here. Here's the carry comparison. RJ Harvey, 190 carries this season, Johnny Richardson, 81. This is very much feeling like a storm Johnson, Williams stand back kind of looking thing. Right, right. No, I, mean, that's not a bad. I would also come back with how often, like, how often have you guys asked the question or, or made the comment going into a game, and rightly so, about our, our excuse me, John Rice Plumley's ability to run? This has been a committee system. It just didn't always involve the running back. For the record, uh, Storm Johnson and William Stanback in 2013. Uh, Storm Johnson had 213 carries, and William Stanback had 105, and that includes a bowl game. <laughs> So I would, so I would, so no, I would say that this, it's more of that kind of thing. Johnny Rich, like, and it isn't to diminish. William Stanback was a really good, like, uh, really good back, yeah. tab when they needed to give Storm Johnson rest. Just like how Johnny Richardson has been very good when they need to sit R.J. Harvey. But make no mistake, R.J. Harvey is the workhorse running back of this UCF system. And last year, it was much more of a running back com by committee approach with Isaiah Browser, which was which is more of a type of running back. Isaiah Bowser was the bruiser. Johnny Richardson was the speedster. And then you had RJ Harvey, who was kind of working in there as well. It was a three running back system. Here, it, there is a clear <laughs> two and not like a 1A, 1B, 1C kind of thing. I, it, I This is still a committee by far, I think, just because uh, RJ has kind of gobbled up Bowser's runs. Really? I see where you're coming well, from. Well, Plumley, how many it's carries has Plumley? That's a good point about that's a good point you make about Plumley, which yeah. helps my argument. Kyle Israel uh, was not a running No, it helps my argument it's because RJ Harvey's getting argument. fewer that's touches. No, that's Kevin Smith had nothing around him. Nothing around him, literally, compared to what RJ Harvey touches, had. How many more touches did Kevin Smith get? That's all the question. Now, granted, because you know, he, I, I think at the end of the day, we're arguing about two elite seasons. And I think the sure. statement should be yeah. made that these are the top two seasons in rushing history. Uh, that, that I don't think that's best seasons. Best seasons. I mean, I don't know what the, the statistics differ, disagree, but I agree with you. I think these are the two and best seasons. No one seasons. talks about Kevin Smith's ability to pass protect either. But me, I'm just a football analyst. or catch the football either. By the way, he was a great receiver. The guy is the best. Yeah. He's pound for pound, arguably the best football player in program history. To me, it's him and Culpepper. Is pound for pound the two best football players at about college? Kevin. Yeah, yeah, he was unbelievable, man. I'm not. I mean, nothing against R.J. Harvey, but Kevin Smith was insane. Kevin Smith, 450 carries in that Ooh. 2007 Ooh. season. Come and on. also, I and what I'm the, saying. Yeah. the next, um, by the way, the next guy behind Kevin Smith. In running back, that's in running back at that season. You want to take a stab on who that was with the second most carries on that 2017. Oh God! Oh Jesus! Uh, Eric, this is your house. I think it was um, what's his face? He was not very good, but he was the a Weaver, wasn't it? Weaver? No. Who was it? Guy by the name of Philip Smith. I don't know. Ow! Philip Ow! Smith. He had, 50, he had 52 carries for 246 yards yeah. and four touchdowns that year. But again, Kyle Israel, by the way, ran the. Oh no, I'm sorry. It was Israel, 90. My bad. Smith was the next running back. 90. Israel, I don't know why. I'm looking at rushing yards. That's what I'm looking at. Um, okay, so Kyle Israel ran the ball 90 times for 178 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, and, and five touchdowns. And, well, if you look at John Rice, Plum, uh, and if you look at Plumley, Plumley actually had what? 76, 76 carries. I mean, I well, how many games did he miss? How many games did he miss? Start every he game, by the way. Yeah, you're right. He didn't yeah, miss. Yeah, yeah. He didn't miss. And that's the other thing I do want to say about this season because 
we had that five game losing streak during which time Plumlee was gone. And I feel like that, no, don't get me wrong. Eric will, Eric will be the first person to say this is that it is that next man up. You need to next man up. And I'm not saying this to excuse it. I'm saying it to just expl, to just explain it because jo with John Rice Plumlee gone, the UCF offense was not at, not at its highest level yet. They still hung around. Don't forget. They did still hang around. And when John Rice Plumlee came back and was kind of working his way back, Oklahoma still, still really, still like kept it right in the game. I truly do feel like that you see that it, I think, I think coming into the season, I think if we remembered like an eight, nine win season was like, was possible. We said it was possible, but six and six and bowl eligibility was the minimum was the minimum. minimum. We will and that, and we will accept that. And yes. are, honestly, I think that's what ended up going down. We could have maybe finished eight or nine wins if John Rice Plumley maybe hadn't gotten hurt. I feel like maybe we could have swapped things a little bit, or at least it would have looked better. Maybe the but, problem is you. We all knew that there was a good chance Plumley was going to go down at some point well, because he, of his injury career history. I mean, that that's – and by the way, Florida, Florida State doesn't want to hear about quarterback issue injuries, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. No, that's a good I mean, point. Yeah. But, uh, look, we'll get to more than – that was fun, by the way. That was a lengthy uh, argument. Um, Maybe yeah, Eric, Eric Edwards chimed in saying, remember Mark Daniels said most of our season this season was like sixth hardest in college football. I'm sure that season uh, 2007 wasn't sixth hardest. Again, who has more talent around him? It's not even close. See, RJ was not even the focal you know, point. Really, Lopez on the ropes when he keeps saying it's not even close, and we have shown clearly that it is close. No, it's uh, like comparing <laughs> Kevin Durant to uh, you know Michael Jordan. You know, it's great. Kevin Durant's awesome, but he's not Michael Jordan. That's all. Great. Uh, to me, to me, RJ is a close second to KS two four K. Um, Roger, Roger, uh, Roger Greenberg chimed in. Nice way to end the regular season at six and six. Now, whoever we play against in the bowl game, let's end this season in a great way. Coach Malzahn said too, that one of the opportunities with the bowl game is to finish with a winning season. And listen, that's a great thing that you can put your hat on too, right? Like, listen, even, uh, our good friend, uh, the Noller here hyped up going seven and six as, as a UCF or excuse me, an FSU fan. And now look what it's turned into for a season. I'm not here to tell you that UCF is going to compete for the college football playoff next year, um, or at least maybe they'll sneak into the top 12. I'm not there to say that, but that is something that matters to guys and programs is having that well, big game. Yes, let's just not throw a parade for a seven and six season. I know Jeff's going to throw a big party on the podcast this week. Oh, what a great year! Wow. Yeah, look, I don't think look, 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 look. looking let's to do say, that. Oh, let's yeah. just say that nice it's like team. let's don't let's not forget that we we look for we we overlook some of the the finer littler things in life. I actually saw this really funny thing of some of. Uh, someone who's not used to celebrating things and then they meet somebody and they go let's just celebrate for something just for no reason and it's one of the and i also actually think about the seattle mariners i remember the docuseries i watched about the seattle mariners what? where they let me let me th say this because all right remember, quick because kyle's got to gotta write an article here they, we kept them they long never, long very they, long they've never won a world they've never won a world series and yet when ken griffey jr came back to their team last game of the season he ended up being a the big reason they won their last game of the season they weren't even going to the playoffs and they were carrying him off the field and the crowd was cheering like they won the world series they know that they're they that they weren't going to the playoffs. we know that this season was not a great season but at the same time i but but at the same time we still it's more of like celebrate ourselves more ourselves and more of the fact that we we got we got here and we're still, I would argue, the uh, compete competing in the Big Twelve. This is just the beginning, but uh, there is better. There are better things to come. But I would but, uh, hope. I would say that this seat that for net for right now we are at where we we are at we we, we are still treading water. And there's a, and and I think that there's I think a beauty in that because when you look at again when you look at these Big Twelve newcomers, you look at Houston, who we just beat. You look at Cincinnati. You look I at BYU, this. who needs to also do what we're really? doing. Really, really, all of these really? people are having a yeah. hard time. So we, yeah. so Eric, I love you, but this is called positive. You guys are the. You know what you guys are. You know what this reminds me of. You're that parent right now at the at travel ball. That's like, hey, my kid deserves a, a, a participation trophy. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, yeah no. that's what you guys are. 
That's what no, you guys Eric are. Lopez, listen, here. My God, I, I can't. I mean, listen, maybe you're spoiled from being endeavored and embedded in softball success, and I'm happy for that for you. But That's fair. I think, Thank you I think the Thank point. Thank you for that. <laughs> but I, I think the point to be made that's the most reasonable and practical without, you know, I mean, and you, again, ignoring that you won money today, that, that uh, with board. all that in mind, I think they've done enough to where Coach Malzahn, who has had historical seasons, each of his seasons recruiting so far, has enough to take with him in his pocket to present to new recruits to make well, this I, evolution I happen. And like, I think that's the biggest victory. That, that's fair. What we no, that's fair. I, that's I, I don't FSU. disagree. Just like with FSU. FSU has had to do that same thing. Seven and six, you bring in the re new recruits, and look what they're doing. Well, he had done more recruit. He, he hit the portal really well. In fairness, yeah. it's not, uh, which is something that got, Mike Norvell for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's something UCF's got to do a better job. Honestly, they didn't hit the transfer portal. Did not hit. Not a lot of success in this past portal one. Uh, I, other than rebuilding their offensive line, I would, I, I would, I would like. To how the linebackers do? The linebackers didn't work. Receivers didn't really. It's as bad as you portray, but there were some successes. Let's be clear about that. Next. Look, I'm not saying it's a bad season. I'm not saying it's a disappointment. I'm just not going to throw a parade for the season. I think yeah, it's in the middle. It's the middle. Is. It's you, like you reach the hey, middle. Listen, again, to your point, there's a source that agrees with you. His name is Gus Malzahn. Listen, and I hope he. And I think I think Gus too is disappointed they didn't win an extra. I think there's a part of it, like and I could tell at his press conferences that he, you know, in the post games when they lost, you could tell he's agitated because they left some plays there that would have won. But, uh, by the way, uh, Evelyn Warner agrees we need some beef. Kyle has a point. I agree with that. All I right, mean, we've, kept Kyle, we've kept Kyle and Nick longer than I planned because Kyle still has got to write an article on night class. Give me your final thoughts from the day and moving forward here, boys, before we let you go. Nick? It's a good way to cap off the season where the only newbies in the Big 12 are going to be going bowling, and that's something I think we can hang our hat on. And I think the season kind of just shows what we've been talking about. It's been a season of ups and downs, things to look back proud on, things to look back upset about. This is the year where we blew a 29-point lead to Baylor, and then it's the year where we Hey, 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 28, 28, all right, 28. All right. I'm trying to forget it, but it's the year where we did that, but it's the same year where we blew out the number 15 ranked team in the country. There's things to look up back on positively. There's things to look at back on negatively, but we're not done yet. We're going to – let's go – we got one more football game, and I'm going to enjoy that fact. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. I BYU, by the way, is currently beating Oklahoma State 14 to 6. They're fighting for bowl eligibility. Oh, 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 oh. So, well, suffice it to say that UCF was the first Big 12 team. Yeah, we did so, it first. We but, did it first. With, you know, I, I won't precisely echo Nick's sentiments, but I will say listen, some of us predicted 6 and 6 back in August. So, for me, I mean, it met the expectations of what I would think to see from this team. And hey, listen, the program should enjoy every bit of the history that came with this season. And listen, I'm going to throw the Jeff Sharon defense on it. Think of where this program was 10 years ago, man. Or heck, when Elo and I were going In the to the Fiesta here. Bowl, that's where we were. Yeah, exactly. Still building, still not respected. It's coming, you know. I think I think that's a big thing. Well, you hope. And, I think you hope, yes. Hope. I, I mean, that's yeah, nothing's, nothing's guaranteed and assumed. Absolutely, you're right. Take it from a Dolphin people. fan. We're still... Dan Marino retired. We didn't find a quarterback. We might have found one in Tua, but that's even still, like, some people still think that's a question mark. The point is nothing's guaranteed, and I think that's, you know, hopefully this recruiting class stays intact in a month. That's the To me, that's the ultimate goal now moving forward. It made more than the bowl game. I think you're just setting me up to talk about Tyreek Hill as the NFL MVP, but okay. He sure. should! It's absurd. <laughs> can you get some common sense to your NFL writers? Like, can we stop giving this to a quarterback? Like, no, Jalen Hurts is not the MVP. Patrick, Ty Tyreek Hill might be having the best receiving season I've ever seen. But anyway, that's a that's a whole – we'll do that we, on we Kyle's We need to podcast. have you back on the soon of the game pod. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you for the plug on that. That's all I'm going to say. Beat a winning what? team. Beat a winning team. That's all I'm going to say. You mean, like – the teams that the Bills couldn't beat, like the Jets and the Broncos? You mean those teams? He's using the deflector them. argument. Okay, cool. Sure. Best player. record in the AFC as of this oh, minute. Funny. Best record in the AFC. That's all I'm saying. Um, I, I just want to win a playoff game, by the way. You realize Dolphins haven't won since 01? 2000. I agree. I agree that. That's all I want. <laughs> really. Uh, anyway, we've, we've, we've rambled long enough, boys. You've been very patient. Kyle Nash, Nick Purcelli. Kyle Nash, look for the night class out on blackandgobetterhead.com soon. Right, Kyle? Absolutely, and look for all the uh, post-game stuff that we're going to drop for you on the Black and Gold Bannerette YouTube channel. Nick Porcelli will be all over that. 
an honor, joy, and privilege here. But from the bounce house, this is Nick Porcelli. I'm Kyle Nash, the student of the game. Until next time, class dismissed. Hey, guys. <laughs> Holy smokes. That was a lot longer than I planned. But we got enough fun later to be. That was fun though. That that was that was really fun. I I always I always love those kinds of arguments that we get that we get into some uh, get into sometimes. And the end of the season is normally where you get that kind of thing. And Eric Edwards just said touchdown BYU. BYU is now starting to do look pretty good against Oklahoma that State. That would mean if that holds up, Oklahoma Texas would be their Big 12 title game. Uh Ooh. so that that'll be a bad one for Oak State. Doesn't help our win. Anyway, um, let's wrap this up real quick here. We got a lot of really the only thing we're going to cover um, basketball is going to be at home Sunday against Stetson. Whoopie do. Donnie Jones will have plenty of time for basketball talk later. Volleyball season came to an end today, Bryson. Real quick, losing a weird, tough four set tight match to Kansas, which was bizarre because you messaged me during the our show that UCF had won the fourth set. Next thing you know, it got changed. What happened? So as I'm looking at it, my here is what I think happened because obviously we were doing the show at the time. So what I think ended up happening is during the is UCF ended up getting a uh and uh, UCF ended up getting a um uh, here it is it's an attack error uh, it was some kind of like attack error thing maybe that it, the th point is that they gave UCF a point. And, it, and on my stat broadcast that I was following, it said UCF 27, Kansas 25, which would be UCF winning the set. So then I turned back and paying attention to the show, thinking that, they're okay, they're going to move on. They're going to, I'll check again later in the fifth set. Then I look back over again, and then I see Kansas is winning 20, 28, 26. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, what, what? So I the best the, the the best thing that I can see from there is that basically they gave UCF a point, Kansas challenged it, it got overturned, and then Kansas ended up coming uh, ended up coming back and getting to and, and coming back and getting the win on a 3-0 scoring run. Which if you're Jenny Mauer and the Knights, that's <laughs> just a horrible way for that. It sounds to me. To I'll watch it at some point tonight, tomorrow, this week. Sounds to me like there was a ball that was hit, that was called out. They reviewed it, it was in, changed the point, whatever, and Kansas ended up winning. So UCF uh, season ends, what is it, 17 and 12? They end up 8 and 10 in conference. Is that right? Yeah, 17 and 12. Yeah. Uh, 8 and 10 in losing, conference, losing, losing 10 of the last 11. Yeah, that. I mean, let's put it this way. I was, I'm not, I, when I saw the gauntlet being what it was, I'm yeah. like, I would not be shocked if we lost all of those games. I'm glad we won one of them, but it was TCU it, it, who was without their best player. Para was out. Yeah. So uh, they so, benefited from that split. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, yes. Indeed. Indeed. They did. Look, I'm glad that they ended up building some, building some momentum. I will say I am, inter I am quite interested to see that Britt Carlson actually, the, actually had quite, a good game getting 12 kills 632 hitting percentage for her she's an outside hitter that will probably be in line to take over a position left vacant by lauren clark who is graduating this year so i think that that's a solid um a, a solid look at things to come but of course now jenny mauer is going it, that means that this will probably be the last match for middle blockers claudia dylan oh, yeah. abby hansen so that now it's going to be about last this season they had to replace the Offense left uh, offense left behind by the departing McKenna Melville and Amber Olson. Net this offseason, it's going to be about all right. Who are going to be our new middle blo middle blockers with Claudia and Abby both gone? So they they basically I think are still trying to really reconstruct this UCF team to fit in the Big Twelve in in the Big Twelve era. Who's very very good at volleyball? Big Twelve is so. I will say this. The fact that they won all of their games, they then got to the gauntlet, which is like the top half of the Big 12 Conference, and then they got steamrolled. They still did contend, though, a little bit. They did contend a little bit in a couple of games, like against Texas. Even in this game, on the road, they contended against Kansas. Kansas. So I would say that they're about mid-pack in the, in the Big 12, which without your star player, McKenna Melville, that's pretty, that's okay. Not great. It's kind of like football. Kind of, kind of the same with, kind of the same thing as the football program. Could we have done better? Sure, but given where our new, our new environment, it's, it's, it's okay. We're not throwing a parade over it, but it's okay. Well, 
we'll get into this more, I think, in a future podcast, maybe this week or not. This was a rebuilding year. Uh, I didn't think they would be an NCAA tournament team. They're not. It's a young group. They got to build from it. To me, if you're disappointed this year, you're you're picking the wrong year. The last few years when you had the greatest player in the history of the program and you didn't get to pass the first weekend, that's where you're more annoyed with than, hey, we didn't make the tournament this year, in my opinion. This is a rebuilding year. And uh, Jenny had her hands tied behind her back. Remember, she got promoted. What was it, Bryce, in May? April. April, late April. Not a lot you could do there. So, anyway, we'll have plenty of more time to talk volleyball and other sports there. But we're going to wrap it up because this went longer than I had planned. Uh, and there's a second half of rivalry football games, a lot of football to go going on right now. We're going to keep tabs on where UCF ends up from a bowl standpoint, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So, anyway, that's going to wrap it up for uh, this show. Uh, thanks to Kyle Nash, Nick Porcelli for uh, part, uh, part covering the game. Thank you, Bryson, for coming on. Thank you for all of you chiming in and uh, with your comments and questions and uh, tuning in. We'll probably do a post-game night shift after a bowl game. We'll see when that is. Bryson might host that. I who knows what I'll do. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's a conflict with basketball. But uh, anyway, we'll see. Uh, until then, uh, we appreciate it. Keep it on blackandgoldbanner.com. We'll keep you updated on all the UCF sports, including the football bowl tie, uh, where UCF goes bowling and everything like that. We might do an abrupt uh, night shift depending on when the bowl game is announced. Maybe we'll do something live, talk about that bowl game. Maybe unless you know. See. Stay tuned is what I say. Thank you for tuning in for Bryce and I'm Eric. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Night Shift. Good night and charge on.